G'day guys, my name is CJ. Can you believe we are up to number 14 for iPhones? Honestly, it seems like yesterday that the iPhone was released in 2007 and I was lining up outside the flagship Optus store in Sydney in 2008 for the iPhone 3G. Now, maybe I'm just old, but a lot has happened in the last 15 years or so of iPhone development. And after using it for the last three to four months, the iPhone 14 Pro is one of the best. Or is it? to iPhones, I think nowadays we have a pretty great idea of what to expect, especially with the flagship Pro models. You've got solid hardware, reliable software, reliable user experience, end of. But it's only really been in the last 12 months that we started seeing something different. It started with new software in iOS 16 where you got more personalization and customization features. And now you've got the Pro, which is the death of the notch and birth of the dynamic island. So we're gonna start there. Now the island is Apple's solution to the display hole punch, which houses both face ID sensors and also the new selfie camera. It's a very Apple way of dealing with change. And instead of just hiding it by maybe just putting a big portion of black on the top of the screen, Apple's gone and fully embraced it. I mean, if they really wanted to just ignore it, they could have just let there be two holes on the front and just call it a day. Kind of like what a lot of Android manufacturers do but that wouldn't look cohesive and Apple-like. So here's the Dynamic Island, which is effectively a way to turn the hole punch into a multitasking and productivity widget. Media goes there, charging goes there, connectivity goes there, navigation goes there, blah, blah, blah. And as more developers support it, there might be even more unique use cases for it. We'll see. I think it looks really cool and I love how well integrated it is with all the smooth animations and all that. But then is it actually useful? Not really. In the grand scheme of the entire user experience, it doesn't change all that much. All it does for me is add a little bit of convenience for at a glance information, which makes the experience a little more cohesive, but that's about it. And to me, the dynamic island encompasses what the iPhone 14 Pro is. It's just a tale of cohesion without really changing much. I mean, look at it. Externally, it's basically the same design as the previous two models. It's a rectangular glass slab, it's got sharp angles, it's made from shiny stainless steel, and it's really solid. I've got the black colorway here, and it is really black. I love it. I also still love the fact that they've stuck with a frosted rear glass, and honestly, it just oozes elegance. That being said, in my experience, either the coating they use for the coloring on the frame is defective, or the stainless steel is just simply scratch prone. I had the phone for just a couple of weeks and despite using a case with it, something I rarely ever do, it already had a chunk of the frame scratched out of it. Now with this phone being as black as it is, this defect really stands out. And so for those with OCD, it might be a bit much to handle. So for such an expensive phone, needing to resort to a Sharpie to hide blemishes for me isn't really a great look. The design, as I mentioned, is over two years old now, but it still looks just as contemporary as ever. The Dynamic Island is another huge benefit of this flat screen is that it's still one of the easiest phones to install a screen protector on, especially given that one isn't pre-installed from the factory. Now, this is something that a lot of Android manufacturers are doing nowadays, and it would be nice to see big players like Apple do the same. Externally, it's otherwise a typical iPhone affair. You've got the big power button on the right, volume buttons on the left, plus the silent switch is still here. There's also still a SIM card tray in this one since I live in Australia, and not many people use eSIMs in their main phone. Internally, we've got the new A16 Bionic chip, which in typical Apple fashion is blazing quick, and the vertical integration of hardware and software means the whole experience is super smooth without any apps showing any lag or jitter. Now, of course, iOS 16 still has little bugs here and there, for example, Spotlight, which used to be one of the best quick search tools, now takes ages to find relevant apps or files. Now this isn't the iPhone 14 Pro's fault, obviously, but it's still to point out that there is still a little bit of refining to be done. But overall, the experience is typical for a flagship Apple, meaning it's a beast in 99% of tasks. I mean, honestly, I'm not a major fan of synthetic benchmarks, but the difference between iPhones and Android equivalents are pretty impressive when it comes to single core 
and especially multi-core performance. As a result, you can expect amazing performance on this phone and throwing pretty much everything at it, including gaming, was absolutely blazing fast and whilst it can get a little bit warm, it never became unbearable. If you need to squeeze the absolute maximum FPS out of your mobile games, then the iPhone 14 really won't disappoint. But what will disappoint you though is battery life. Now there's a 3200 milliamp hour battery inside, which isn't massive to begin with, but even despite software optimization, the battery life inside is only about average and that's probably being kind to it too. It's certainly not the worst, but in terms of flagship standards, it's really not that great. Now I don't often need to charge my phone up in the middle of the day, but there have been times where even early to mid afternoon, it was looking a little dicey and straight up scary when I was gaming for extended periods. I'd say on average, I'd get to the end of the day with less than 10% of battery life, guaranteed. So on most days, it will get me to the end of a day without needing a charge, but if you forget to charge it overnight, prepared not to have a phone for the next day. If you game or take a lot of photos and shoot a lot of video, you'll definitely want to have a charger or power bank close by though. Now on average, I get round about four, maybe four and a half hours of screen on time at best. And my days often involve quite a bit of web browsing, Instagram doom scrolling and YouTube binging. Of course, we've got faster charging and faster MagSafe wireless charging in tow, up to 27 watts. But even then, we're not really getting the same blistering Android speeds of something like an Oppo VOOC charge at 120 watts here. Though I would hazard to say for most people, it'll probably be okay. But as I mentioned before, power users will probably need to have a spare power bank or a charger. Now, speaking of power users, the cameras have been a really positive upgrade. It's still a triple camera setup with a standard wide, ultra wide, three times telephoto zoom. But the biggest upgrade here is that much larger 50 megapixel sensor that enables a quote unquote native two times zoom, basically by just cropping the middle of the sensor itself. Now let's be honest though, this isn't the same as a true dedicated lens that does two times zoom. This is still digital zoom, but because the main sensor is now 50 megapixels, the resolution of the two times zoom is equivalent to 12 megapixels, which is very smart from a business and marketing perspective, but the equivalent look of a two times zoom really isn't the same and you won't get the same level of background compression that you get from a true optical two times zoom. It's what makes getting dedicated telephoto zooms so much fun with DSLR and mirrorless cameras. That unique look you get from a true optical zoom really can't be replaced digitally just by cropping. And that's why you'll never see pros shoot only with wide angle lenses and high megapixel cameras. Because otherwise, why would you bother? And whilst the quality is fine with the two times zoom, I always ended up opting for the optical three times and just moved backwards physically because it just looked sharper, more natural and more pleasing because you get that more unique background compression. Now in a pinch, if you needed to get just a little bit closer, then the two times zoom will be fine, but otherwise it's nothing more than marketing BS to make it sound like it has more features than it really does. But zoom gimmicks aside, the actual camera performance is a true flagship story. It doesn't really have any weaknesses. In daytime, it's just as good as any other competitor. And in low light, that big sensor does a great job capturing details. There's nice natural bokeh, and if it's just a little too dark, it still has one of the best night modes in any phone. Now, the ultra wide is also an autofocusing beast that produces really sharp ultra wide dynamic photos, which is often such a weakness in ultra wide lenses in smartphones. Plus, it still happily doubles as a macro lens and remains as one of the only useful macro lenses in any phone. Photos on the whole are accurate, reliable, quite neutral in tone and not overly saturated, but detailed. Now, it's not super dramatic like a Galaxy or a Pixel, but it acts as a great starting point because let's be honest, most people are gonna do a tiny little bit of tweaking in their favorite social media app anyway. Now the other surprise here is that selfie lens, which is now auto-focusing. I can't believe it's taken this long, but this is truly the only way you can get proper, sharp and detailed photos without guessing the optimal focus distance. And I'm loving the quality of photos coming from this. Thanks not only to the auto-focusing system, but also it has a wider f1.9 aperture, meaning it captures more light, more detail, and you can really see it results, especially in lower light. And then there's video. What more can I say that hasn't already been said about the iPhone and video shooting? It's the king and it's the most reliable. 
though we'll see with the S23 Ultra this year. But anyway, all the way up to 4K 60 frames per second, you'll have guaranteed great looking video. The stabilization, image quality, dynamic range, the audio, the autofocus, it all just works. And now that there's an added active stabilization mode, there's hardly any setting that you can't really rely on the iPhone to make great looking video. Plus, its cinematic video mode supports up to 4K now, which is great because honestly, in my opinion, it does a quite a decent job at making your home videos look a little more cinematic. I mean, sure, it's still ultimately a background blur filter slapped onto your video, but honestly, I was quite pleasantly surprised at how some of these videos turned out. So in terms of a total camera package, for me, it's still one of the best and one of the most reliable shooters out there. If you're someone who really prioritized the camera output for both photography and video, you can't go wrong here. Now all of this performance and cohesion in design does come at a cost though. As you'd expect, the iPhone 14 Pro starts, starts at $1,749 for the base 128 gig model, which given the same size of some of these photos and videos that are shot at, 128 gigs is getting to a bit of a joke and really should start at 256 gigs. But anyway, depending on what storage configuration you need, it can top out at 2,600 Australian dollars for the one terabyte version, which is absolutely insane. But it does pack a lot of power and features for the price. But is it worth the price? Well, if you make money with your smartphone or a professional content creator, then probably. But for everyone else, probably not. Even if this phone is really, really quite nice. Google and the Pixel has shown that you can still have top flagship performance without costing a kidney. But you know what? People will still buy this phone and the next iPhone year on year after that. So if you've got an iPhone 13 Pro or even an iPhone 12 Pro, you don't need the 14 Pro. But if you're coming from an iPhone 11 or older, then this could be a phone for you. Anyway, what do you guys think of the iPhone 14 Pro? Who do you think should buy this phone? Keep it civil, let me know in the comments section below. In any case, if you enjoyed this video, give us a like, subscribe for more, ding the bell icon so you don't miss out, and stay safe out there. I'll catch you in the next one. Cheers.